Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I have your attention, please? We, we are just about ready to begin, but I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. First of all, I would like to beg your indulgence and request you to switch off your phones or put them on silent. Secondly, uh, the restrooms, the rest, I don't know why they call them restrooms. Does anybody go there to rest? <laughs> but anyway, you, you know what I mean. They are, if you go out the door, you take right and then take right again. They are kind of directly behind me. So in case you need to use the restrooms, that's where they are. Uh, thirdly, quite a number of people phoned us during these, the preparations for this lecture asking whether they could have a one-on-one -on -one with the Chief Justice. <laughs> well, I don't think there's anything strange about that. It's just practically not possible. So in order to address that, the Chief Justice has kindly accepted to, for there to be a question and answer session after his uh, lecture. I will be facilitating the question and answer session and uh, I, will, I will be very, rather I'll beg you to, you know, make your questions uh, very brief, specific and to the point because I'm aware there are a number of people who want to ask questions. And finally, um, the Chief Justice is just about to walk in and I'll ask you to arise and help me welcome him to the podium. The Honorable Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, Justice Mohueng Mohueng, and your lovely wife, Mrs. Anna Mohueng, the President of the Supreme Court of Appeal of South Africa, all judges of the Supreme Court of Appeal, the Judge President of the Free State Division of the High Court, all judges of the Free State Division of the High Court, all the members of the legal fraternity present here, acting rector and vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, members of the University Council who are present here, members of the rectorate, the executive of the University of the Free State, deans of faculties, staff and students of the Faculty of Law, members of the Student Representative Council and other student formations, all members of the university community present here and those watching the proceedings on all our campuses through live streaming, ladies and gentlemen. It is my singular pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to this Faculty of Law Prestige Lecture presented by the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, Justice Mohueng Mohueng. I particularly want to welcome and thank the Chief Justice 
for accepting our invitation to come and present this lecture. I'm sure we all know that the Chief Justice is one of the busiest human beings on the planet. And we are all therefore grateful that he could find some time in his busy schedule to come and present this lecture. I also wish to welcome all of you on behalf of the Rector and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Francis Peterson, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this evening due to a long-standing international engagement that he's honoring right now. He is represented by the Acting Vice-Chancellor, Rector, uh, Professor Prakash Naidu, who I have already acknowledged. Let me also welcome distinguished visitors, including honorable judges and all members of the legal profession who are here today. And I also wish to welcome other visitors from outside the university, members and leaders of civil society in your, in your respective capacities, and members of the media. Of course, I'm not forgetting members of the university community, staff and students, particularly staff and students of the Faculty of Law. Welcome and thank you for being here. I thought I should say a few words about the prestige lec lecture series so as to place this particular context, uh, this particular lecture in proper context. Now, the Faculty of Law Prestige Lecture Series was initially known as the Law Dean's Prestige Lecture Series, and they were the brainchild of the late and former Dean of the Faculty, Professor Johann Henning. The series started in 2011 as an initiative to encourage, develop, and expand academic discourse on the campus of the university on topical jurisprudential issues and other related matters. These lectures were meant to be academically inclusive, where everyone was welcome to attend and partake in the academic discourse. The series ran for a number of years, but about three years ago, they fizzled out. Previous lectures were delivered by, among others, Professor Barry Ryder of the University of Cambridge, Justice Richard Goldstone, formerly of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, former Deputy Chief Justice Dikhang Moseneke, and more recently, Judge Dennis Davis, who was acting as uh, in the Supreme Court of Appeal. So at the beginning of this year, we made a decision to revive this lecture series for two main reasons. One, because of the jurisprudential and academic value of the lectures, and two, as an honor in the legacy, uh, to the legacy of Professor Johann Henning. And although I didn't know him personally, I have no doubt in my mind that he did a great job, a great job running this faculty as he did for 17 years. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Of course, it would have been a whole lot easier to say the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa needs no introduction. But I think that's a dangerous thing to do. I'll tell you a little story. I was appointed here dean at the beginning of, of last year, and there was a lot of fanfare and publicity about this first black dean of the law faculty. That's a title I don't like, but... <laughs> so you would have thought that, you know, people know the first black law dean. Now, especially law students. Now, two weeks ago, I was walking through the corridors of the faculty, and I had two students talking to each other. I have heard them. I was not supposed to hear what they were saying. <laughs> so one of them asked, who is that guy? <laughs> and the other one said, I think he's our new tutorial assistant. <laughs> So, we don't want the Chief Justice to be walking out of here and someone asks, who is that guy? <laughs> and then the other one answers, I think he's the new, the new Lord Dean. <laughs> so, Chief Justice Mwheng Mwheng is the fourth Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa since the dawn of democracy. He was born in a small village called 
Ho Mokata, and that is in the northwest province of South Africa. The Chief Justice holds a B.U.R.S. degree and a Bachelor of Laws degree from the universities of Zululand and Natal, respectively. And he also holds a Master's of Law in, from the University of South Africa. In June 1999, he was appointed as a judge of the Northwest High Court. And in April 2000, he was appointed judge of the Labor Appeal Court. Then in October 2002, he was elevated to the position of judge president of the Northwest, Coast, Northwest High Court. He was appointed to the Constitutional Court of the Republic in 2009 and subsequently elevated to the position of Chief Justice of the Republic on the 8th of September 2011. In October 2013, the University of the Northwest awarded the Chief Justice an honorary doctor, doctor of laws. And on the 27th of March 2018, the University of Johannesburg did the same. Now, in April 2017, the Chief Justice was elected the president of the Conference of Constitutional Jurisdictions of Africa for a period of two years. And in August 2017, he was appointed chancellor of the University of KwaZulu-Natal for a period of four years. He is married to Anna Mapelo, who, has, Mapefo, who have, I have already acknowledged, and they have been blessed with three children. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the Chief Justice of South Africa, Mohamed. Thank you very much. The esteemed Dean of the Faculty of Law, the President of the Supreme Court of Appeal, Justice Maya, who is also the President of the International Association of Women Judges, the South African chapter, my colleagues in the Supreme Court of Appeal and the High Court, the leadership of this great university, lecturers, students, ladies and gentlemen, inclusive of the media, I greet you all. I've been asked to tackle a topic that has been tackled by many, transformative constitutionalism. <laughs> And I plan to, as briefly as a lawyer can, <laughs> share some reflections and leave time for a question and answer session. What is transformative constitutionalism? It's necessary just to try and explain it because people, when they want to confuse you, use these big words. And then you're left wondering, whether you're stupid, when in fact there is a way of simplifying whatever jargon they are dishing out. It can only mean using the Constitution as a tool for changing or moving a family, society, institutions, or the nation to, well, from an unacceptable or less acceptable position to a more desirable or good, better, or best position. It really is all about the pursuit of commendable progress or the fulfillment of a national dream through the instrumentality of the Constitution. And in a South African context, it is decidedly about 
rejecting the legacy of colonialism and apartheid and moving along to the collective, to the realization of the collective aspirations that are contained in our constitution. Now, to deal properly with this issue, there are a lot of politics involved. And maybe I should just uh, uh, justify why a person like me who is a judge should be involved in such, in such a, a, a debate. There is a belief that judges should have nothing to do with matters political. I agree, but only to a limited extent. We shouldn't be campaigning for political parties. We shouldn't be raising funds for political parties. We shouldn't be members of political parties. <laughs> but you can't do justice to transformative constitutionalism as a topic without traversing a number of political landmines. Judges are supposed to deal with political issues as they interpret the constitution and the law. It's inescapable in a South African context. Look at our judgments in case of doubt as politics after politics after politics. And it can only be a consequence of lack of understanding for someone to suggest that a judge is entitled to deal with political issues like the procedure to be followed in removing a president through a motion of no confidence from his or her position, and yet you're not allowed to say anything about it when you address a meeting like this. Whatever it is that a judge is allowed to deal with in a judgment, a judge is equally entitled to deal with it in a lecture like this and even in a press briefing, briefing or a media interview. Some say judges should only speak through their judgments. Really? So I shouldn't have accepted this invitation? I should never conv uh, call a press conference even if there are critical issues that needs to be addressed because I won't be delivering a judgment. I've always said our constitution is political in nature. And just in case you think I'm the only one who thinks so, I think I better quote what uh, one of my predecessors Justice Pius Langa said some 13 years ago when called upon to address the same topic. This is what he said, open quotes. Under a transformative constitution, judges bear the ultimate responsibility to justify their decisions not only by reference to authority, but by reference to ideas and values. This approach to adjudication requires an acceptance of the politics of law. There is no longer place for assertions that the law can be kept isolated from politics. While they are not the same, they are inherently and necessarily linked. Close quote. We have to examine what we have committed ourselves to as a nation to do justice to the topic. And all that is to be found in the preamble to our constitution, as well as section one of the constitution. Part of what we say it looks like I've misplaced my papers. Let me just speak. <laughs> we commit ourselves to honoring those who have fought for freedom and justice and respecting all those who labored, who worked hard to develop our nation, to develop our country. But what the Constitution, the preamble also says is that this country 
belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. A number of issues flow out of it. We've committed ourselves as part of the transformation process through the instrumentality of our constitution to heal, to heal the divisions of our past. And as I raise these issues, please keep on asking yourself a question. Just how much have we allowed our, our constitution to help us achieve these objectives? Where are we? If we have failed, why? And what is it that we can do from now going forward? We have committed ourselves to unite this country, to improve the quality of life of every citizen, and to free the potential of each person, such as the students who are here. We have committed ourselves to taking our rightful place in the family of nations. Some of our foundational values are equality, human dignity, rule of law, supremacy of the constitution, accountability, responsiveness, and openness. So where are we? We cannot afford to have a gathering like this and overindulge in theories, in circumstances where, in the words of our president, we are in a crisis. We've got to seize every opportunity at our disposal to contribute towards the realization of our shared aspirations. What is it that we have done to heal the divisions of our past? In any event, what were those divisions? Racism was institutionalized in South Africa. Ethnicity was the order of the day. Tribalism was encouraged. That is why we had as many homelands as there were African languages. Now, what program in response to this mandate, in response to this responsibility that we have individually and collectively, what is it that we did to give practical expression to these urgent issues that the liberation struggle was about that we as black and white people we're virtually at war with one another about. You don't get divided by something, commit to healing that division, and not have a credible program of action through which you are going to address that issue. So just there, what have we done? Why is it that there are incidents of racism incidents of uh, tribalism or divisions that are traceable to either racism or tribalism 25 years into our constitutional democracy. Let me try and offer a solution as I go along. It has got to start with a family. We all have the opportunity to speak. Let us make it our business wherever we are to share ideas in relation to how we can use the foundational values of our democratic state, how we can use the Bill of Rights, including the preamble, at a family level, at the early learning center level, at primary school level, at, at the level of a uh, faith-based organization, high school, university, even the workplace, to instill those values, to encourage everybody to embrace that value system, that belief system, 
that can help us realize these objectives. And that means, what do I teach my children and my grandchildren? Because a community springs out of a family. And the state of the family, the induction of the young ones as they grow, what we tell them about the different races, the different genders, will inform the kind of community that we become. And by extension, the community we turn out to be will explain the kind of nation that we, that we are. Generally, it looks like we haven't invested much effort and energy, much intellect in finding ways to give birth in a practical way to the South Africa that we said we're going to, to give birth to. I was raised to believe that the Zulu people the Tosa people, anybody who is not a Motswana is not a proper human being. <laughs> and I therefore, and I experienced when I got to the University of Zululand that that was their orientation as well. They would address you as Isilwana, which means an animal. Can't blame them. It all comes from home. When I went to the University of Zululand, my parents and grandparents said, please don't bring a Zulu woman here. <laughs> what about the racial factor? What do you teach your children about white people, about Indians? What do you as a white uh, a South African teach them about a black person, teach them about a colored person, First Nation people, or the Indian people, or other nationalities? Does it concern you that we almost destroyed ourselves as a people because of racism, ethnicity, and tribalism? And if it does, why is it that you don't spend sleepless nights about it, trying to find a solution, sharing it with those within your circle of influence? I think it is something that we must think about, talk about openly so that others can grasp these concepts and do something about it. You see, the constitution or a constitution, however good it may be, does not implement itself. It takes people with a particular mindset, with certain convictions, to give practical expression to it. And that extends to making sure that that foundational value of non-racialism and non-sexism is achieved. Many women, however good they may be, although we all talk about transformation, we will never allow them to become what they deserve to become. Have you wondered why the world over we celebrate when a woman is a prime minister or a president? There is a mindset out there to divide women so that they support men, they don't support fellow women. Not that they must be anti-men, but for men to also marginalize women and even go so far as, say, oh, she's only a woman, what do you expect? These emotional people. <laughs> what are we doing about it? It's all very well to come here and and deliver a speech or a lecture and say things which I know you expect me to say. In other words, to be politically correct, when in fact, nothing of the sort is in my heart or mind. Let's do something about racism. The easiest thing that you can do is to criticize. Just sit back lazily and say, what is government doing? You are government. The preamble to our constitution says the government must be based on the will of the people, and I hope to touch on that, will of the people. So there are divisions to be healed. Injustices of the past. What is it that the constitution is supposed to do about the injustices of the past? What were they? Exclusivity in relation to meaningful participation in the mainstream economy. 
I was addressing uh, the competition commission uh, in Pretoria today. They had a conference. And one of their primary responsibilities is to make sure that the economic space is opened up for small business enterprises. In other words, those who never before had the opportunity to participate meaningfully in the economy, it is the responsibility of the Competition Commission, according to the long title, the preamble, and the purpose of the act, to make sure that a way is found for them to, at long last, participate in the economy. And it doesn't look like they have achieved that. Doesn't it worry you? Should it not worry you? Because when millions do not have jobs, when millions do not have what to eat, Desperation tends to set in. And a desperate person is an uncontrollable person. You see, unemployment, poverty causes you to lose your human dignity. And when you lose your human dignity, a foundational value of our constitution, you can't respect the dignity of another. You can't give what you don't have. That's what makes it possible for people to rape. You don't respect yourself. So you don't know what it means to respect another human being. I'm not saying that every rapist does it because they don't have a job. Some of them are even wealthy. But the overwhelming majority, check. How do you get to even rape your own daughter? So, what is it that needs to be done to free the potential of those business people who just want a chance, a little bit of financing, to run their little shop in a village, in a township, or in the city? What mode of financing is there flowing from our individual and shared constitutional responsibilities to make sure that we improve the quality of life of each and free the potential of every person. I was confronted after some lecture I delivered somewhere to people from all over Africa earlier in the year by one of our first ladies. She said, you know, I heard you talk about the concept of think tanks and how we can use it to transform the nation. I want you to tell me more about it. We spent an hour because I didn't have time. But this is the point. She said, you know, for a long time I have been asking our government and the Reserve Bank to create an opportunity for meaningful funding for those with the potential to start up business, to have those businesses. But I don't get a sense that I'm going to get help. He says it's been going on for years. What are we going to do about it? What suggestions are we going to come up with to make sure that an old man who doesn't even have money to start up a maguena business, sell peanuts, plant the field that they are allocated in the villages there, does not only get funding, but has the technical know-how to farm properly, shared with them. Somebody wants to start with, a, with goats, doesn't want to steal. They appreciate that there is dignity in working and living out of your sweat. How are we going to make sure that we transform everybody at a level of a village, township, and wheresoever to realize our shared aspirations. The will of the people. Government based on the will of the people. I'm not too sure where that exists. And transformation demands of you and I to make sure that our government is truly based on the will of the people. And I repeat, some will say it's politics, it's not. 
Some will say I'm targeting certain personalities. No, it's not in my space to target people. I deal with principles. We will only... <laughs> We will only get a government based on the will of the people if we, the people, fund the electoral process. If we, the taxpayers, because elections don't happen every day or every year, allocate a budget, come up with a criteria that we are comfortable with a negotiated criteria for sharing whatever number of billions or, or millions of hundreds of millions to fund our political players. Because if I am a multi-billionaire and I give you one billion as a party to run your campaign and you win, are you based on the will of the people as a government or on Mohuen's will? <laughs> and once you are there, do I even have to remind you? <laughs> Mine is just to come and greet you. <laughs> Mine is just to come and greet you. Say yes. Prasa wants trains. I like the train business, you know. <laughs> and walk away. You know what it means. So desperate as we are, we need to do everything possible to make sure that at the end of the day, imperfect as the system might be, whatever government emerges at any level is truly based on the will of the people. Because when it is, then there will be responsiveness. Then there will be accountability. You will know who put you there. Maybe let me wrap it up this way. I was talking to an analyst. Sometimes he's an economic analyst. Sometimes he's a political analyst today. And he's one of the most sober analysts I've come across. So I called him. From time to time, we call each other, hey, my brother, what is happening in our country? And I said to him, what do you think it will take to shape our country in the right direction? I must confess his views coincided with mine. He said, what you need is ethical courageous and visionary leadership. In other words, no matter the consequences, if this be the right thing to do, for the sake of the suffering masses, I'm going to do it. If you want to throw me out, throw me out. To, he said, or oh, maybe I should stay there a bit. You, you see, that comes with an effective performance monitoring and evaluation system. I've seen some countries with that. There's so much effectiveness that from time to time when a meeting happens, the leader of the nation knows what every department what every state-owned enterprise is doing, and you've got to account. Time frames are given within which to improve. That's what we need. By the way, I think I'm free to refer to China because last week Thursday I was addressing some 350 business people in Cape Town, and they quoted uh, a Chinese leader, so I have been liberated. I won't be called a communist. <laughs> A man by the name of Deng Xiaoping, who was really persecuted for seeking to do the right thing, is the reason for the incredible
progress that China has made. Put aside whatever shortcomings you have identified about China. The economic revolution in China owes its existence to an insistence on appointing to leadership positions at every level. Only people who know what they are doing. People whose heart is in serving. People who are accountable or else there will be consequences. Now the next point is that strong institutions. And it's true. We need strong institutions. Independent institutions. Well-resourced institutions. To reconnect with our dream and give it practical expression. That is why members of the public must be very careful how they criticize institutions. Institutions, including the judiciary, must be criticized, but not anyhow. You can't just, as a member of the public, say, the South African judiciary is corrupt. <laughs> I know I'm not corrupt, so who are you talking about? You've got to be able to tell us so-and-so is corrupt because this is what they did. But by just gratuitously saying they are corrupt and failing to substantiate your allegation, you are weakening the institution known as the judiciary. You are delegitimizing that institution. The next thing, people want to obey court orders. They will say, ah, oh, I will not obey an order by these corrupt people. And there is a danger. We may choose to sue you. But guess what your response is going to be? You, the irresponsible one. Going to say, oh, so the judges are suing me. Who's going to decide? <laughs> their own colleagues. They've already captured their colleagues to rule against me. So institutions must be strong, and as I pass by this point, just know institutions are not only capable of being captured by external forces. There is internal capture. Never forget that. I can come in as a leader in a particular institution and use my influence to have it my way to have it my friend's way by ensuring that I dish out patronage to my people, I intimidate them, and therefore, those people are not doing what they are supposed to do because I've captured them. So we've got to be vigilant against any form of abuse of power or capture. Strong institutions. And education. Ah, we've got to know what it is that we want to achieve through education. Happily, this is an institution of higher learning. You've got to worry about the quality and the state of our education at every level. What is it that we've been teaching our children all these years? Why is it that 25 years down the line, we're talking about educating them in such a way that they can read for many? What have they been doing all this long? So instead of just pointing fingers at government, we've got to accept that we too, as the people, as the citizens, have failed. What needs to be done? Talk about it, raise it. Government needs your advice. Members of society want to know what your views are. That's why government and other institutions hold in Bezos, so that they can hear from you. So speak out, write articles suggest what it is that needs to be done for quality education to emerge. People who come from our high schools must adapt with ease to a university. Rather than coming here, failing until you become a, an ancestor of the university. <laughs> so finally, where to from here? I think the, the issues that I've highlighted are part and parcel of where to from here. 
We need people who truly love their country and their people to assume positions of responsibility. Unless you genuinely care about another person, there is no way in which you can serve them as well as they need to be served. You see, transformative constitutionalism is all about giving expression in a practical way to the vision, the ideals of Nelson Mandela. People never forget from the free state we had a man by the name of Bram Fisher who grew up in a farm, didn't see race as anything of consequence. Just saw human beings insulting one another in Sesotho, in Africans, and so on. Until he went to the university and they sort of changed him. But he sacrificed his life because he loved all South Africans, black and white. We have fallen in love with money. We have fallen in love with prestige. We have fallen in love with fame. We have fallen in love with power. What about those who died and suffered like Nelson Mandela? So that we can have this opportunity. How can we forget so soon? That is not over. We can all vote, but people are still starving. The land issue is not there resolved, and it is threatening to divide us in a very painful way. Shouldn't it give you and I sleepless nights? South Africa belongs to all, not some, who live in it, united in our diversity. And you can see when danger is looming in the horizon. What are you doing about it? Are you going to follow what excites a lazy mind, or are you going to sit, pause, reflect, and remember just how resilient we are as a people, we the people of South Africa. Look for solutions, enduring solutions, based on the truth. You're not buying anybody's face. You shouldn't be insulting, don't harden attitude. Look for a solution, for an engagement, based on a compromise that can bring us together as the people of South Africa. That is the way to go. Look for ways to reduce the burden on the shoulders of the fiscals. Look for ways to tackle the issue of people finding it easy to avoid paying tax. Look for ways to make sure that this illicit, what is the expression? Illicit way of taking money out of the country in the billions which the investigation of President Mbeki found to be a reality in Africa, comes to an end. Just imagine what could be done with that. Look for ways to help all of our people, especially able-bodied people, to move away from dependency on social grants. That thing is not sustainable. It should be for all people. It should be people for people with disability. It's fine for it to be here, there for now, but as we come up with a plan that will free people from this dependency, look for a way for people to build their own houses. Can't be building houses for people. It never used to be like that. In my village, we built our own houses, and there was pride that came with knowing that you build this house, met your eight to hand. Rwanda is doing it. A number of nations are doing it. China is doing it. Singapore did it. Why can't we did it as in Pepe said? <laughs> so wherever you are, know that uh, transformative constitutionalism is basically about what is your primary preoccupation in life? As a student, as a lecturer, as a magistrate, as a judge, what are you living for? What difference do you want to bring about in the lives of others and in your nation? 
This obsession with uh, BMWs, first thing, you're living in a shack, but you are driving a new BMW. <laughs> For what? Are there not people out there that you can assist? Are you prepared to even serve the state, or is it the private sector you prepare, prefer because there's a lot of money there? Do you love your nation? Do you love this continent? Do you love humanity? What examples do you draw from people like Mama Albertina Sisulu and all those who opted for the greater good of many rather than personal benefit or satisfaction? It is not too late. I am glad we are where we are because it's time to sober up. It is the end of 25 years. It's time to sober up and begin a new journey. And believe you me, the best is just around the corner. In uh, Cape Town, I said, you see, it's, it's, it's for good reason. I believe that I'm here to address people who are in the Cape of Good Hope. It is not the Cape of Bad Hope. Now, we are in the free state. Freedom from poverty, division, strife, stagnation, and junk status is around the corner. What matters the most is what are you going to do from here? Are you going to pursue peace? Are you going to pursue unity and reconciliation? Or are you going to contribute towards the further division of the people of South Africa? Are you going to pursue greed and corruption? Or are you going to pursue justice? I just like what former Secretary General Kofi Annan said, and maybe I must quote him. Listen to what he said. The United Nations has learned that the rule of law is not a luxury and that justice is not a side issue. We have seen people lose faith in a peace process when they do not feel safe from crime. We have seen that without a credible machinery to enforce the law and resolve disputes, people resorted to violence and illegal means. And we have seen that elections held when the rule of law is too fragile seldom lead to lasting democratic governance. We have learned that the rule of law delayed is lasting peace denied, and that justice is a handmaiden of true peace. We must take a comprehensive approach to justice and the rule of law. It should encompass the entire criminal justice chain, not only police, but lawyers, prosecutors, judges, and prison officers, as well as many issues beyond the criminal justice system but a one size fits all does not work close code. Go out there and pursue social justice. Don't be buying things from thieves because they are cheap. You are encouraging crime when you do so. Don't discriminate. Our country in a is in a state that does not allow us to go about our lives as we have been all this long. There's, there are a number of things fundamentally wrong about how we have approached the affairs of our country and you can't continue this way and expect a different outcome. So let's make a very brutal self-introspection, brutal national introspection Identify our mistakes. Hold on to the hope of the likes of Rwanda. Rwanda, they killed each other into the millions. But 1994, when we became a constitutional democracy, they started. Now they are miles ahead of South Africa. And they are not in Europe, they are here. There's cleanliness, there is discipline, there is no corruption. We can talk about the human rights issues aside. I believe in copying the good that I see other people do 
rather than focus on their weaknesses or their points of criticism. It is not too late. Go out there and contribute towards building the South Africa that we can all be proud of. Thank you. You are not done yet. Another round of applause. Thank you. We are now going to have the question and answer session. I would like us to be very organized about this. There are many people who want to ask questions. And we may not take all the questions, but we'll take as many as we can. There are four mics in each corner of the room, roving mics. Now, we will take questions in sets of three. So we'll ask the first three questions, then the Chief Justice will come and address them, and then another three questions, and um, we've got about 30 minutes to do that. Now, I'd like to ask you kindly, please, be specific in your question. Because if you waffle and become <laughs> long-winded, then the Chief Justice will not be able to actually grasp your question, and therefore, he won't be able to answer it properly. Be specific to the point. And yeah, so we'll take the first set of three questions. Uh, there is a hand that sprang up here as soon as I... <laughs> yeah, I think it is a CV right here. That's the first question. Uh, good evening to the Chief Justice, all judges and everyone here. Uh, my name is Asive Uh Chief Justice, uh, my question is this. Uh, you were speaking of uh, a transformative uh, a transformation and transformative constitutionalism, yeah. Now, uh, my question is this. There are students that were arrested during the FISMAS 4. Uh, me and you will agree that it was in the struggle for free education, which in itself is probably one of the biggest struggles towards the transformation, not just of the higher learning, but of our societies as a whole. The students had asked the president to pardon all of those uh, 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 activists that had been arrested. And uh, a few days ago, the Minister of Justice responded uh, saying that there would be no uh, a, a wide amnesty for those students uh, that were uh, uh, arrested. And our contention is this, Chief Justice, to say, if government affirmed the struggle of the students by giving that which they were fighting for, why are they being penalized for what it took for them to, for what it took for the struggle to become a victory? Why is government giving free education for something they clearly, uh, 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 they, 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 in fact, why are they uh, persecuting the students? However, they have then uh, agreed with the student that in fact that was a noble cause. The government of the day is now having, is now campaigned on the backs of those students, say, talking about free education. However, now that they're in government, they are refusing for those students to say that those students do not know what is going to happen with their careers because they are still going to court. The question is this, what is the difference between that and the people that were given amnesty in the TRC who had killed the people? And <laughs> what is the difference? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's take the second question. The second question, I see a hand right in the middle there. Two hands in fact. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Thank you, Honorable Chief Justice. My uh, question relates to the Employment Equity Act. And um, 
basically the perception that comes with this act of those who've been employed as employment equity appointments are unreservable and incompetent. And I've, if I can remember a book by the diversity consultant Nene Molefe who was part of the writing of that act is that it was there to acknowledge the wrongs of the previous system. So why are our people, those that have been previously marginalized, rejecting those, that act? Making it clear, I am not an employment equity appointment. What contributed to that perception? Thank you. Let's take the third question. Uh, right behind you. Yes, yes, that's right. Is it right? All right. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> My name is Sheikh Sash. I'm the provincial organizer of Salip Su. Use, use the mic uh, uh, closer uh, to you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, no, it's on, it's on. Go yeah, ahead. A union called Salip Su. Wait uh, a minute. Oh, okay. Yes. I've got, I've got a document with me here. All right, Chair. go ahead, go ahead. You, you will be next. Okay, go ahead. My question is very simple to Chief Justice. Protection of the whistleblowers. I've got a document here. We have tried to get assistance from different authorities. We didn't get any assistance. Now I want Chief Justice to assist us about the protection of the whistleblowers. Here is my document. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for those questions. It is the third time, for the third time, that I'm taking, I'm asking a question about fees must fall. It is, it is an issue that does not require judicial intervention. It requires political intervention. And that is why it had to be taken to the president because at this stage, only the president can deal with it. And just in case there is criticism against the judiciary, maybe for having found guilty those that were charged, here is how the system works. When somebody is said to have done something wrong, say there are witnesses who say you have touched the building or destroyed the vehicle, and they say the law says you shouldn't do this, is whatever crime, the prosecutors prosecute, the magistrate or judge looks at the law and the facts and is satisfied that the law was broken. The judicial establishment or the court system can only say, well, in terms of the law, you are guilty. This is the appropriate sentence. What then follows, as is the case with the TRC process, is for political intervention to step in. Remember, it was not the judges who pardoned those people. No, it was a political process out and out. So I would urge you to please <clears throat> come together and, if possible, make contact with the general counsel of the bar. They from time to time assist for free and their tennis profession through their pro bono system. Their national body does intervene. Or structures like the Legal Resources Center and say, look, we are concerned about this issue. And we don't want, now that the, the minister says there won't be blanket amnesty, we want to structure our request for amnesty in such a way that none of our people who we believe deserves amnesty is left out. And because we are not familiar with this territory, please help us craft a convincing document to the president so that when he reads it, he would be left with no choice but to grant everybody amnesty. That's how to go about it. As for, as for employment equity, Employment equity is fundamentally designed to ensure that you don't differentiate between people on the basis of gender, race, or color. I was saying to one meeting uh, of the business people some two years back that I was disturbed reading two different newspapers. An article was run that in a particular company for computer programming, 
If you are a white male, you earn so much. If you are a white uh, woman, you earn less than a white male. And as a black person, same qualifications, if not more, and experience, you would end below a white uh, um, a compatriot, and a black woman will end less than a black man. The employment equity is designed to make sure that there is justice, there is equity, there is fairness in the marketplace. That is the first part. But what I think you're also alluding to, my sister, is affirmative action. Should never be ashamed of being an affirmative action appointment. I'm an affirmative action appointment. I mean, when I, when I was approached to be, make myself available as a judge, I was refusing because my dream was I want to be senior counsel first. I don't want anybody to question my suitability for judicial appointment, so I'm refusing. People said, no, you are fit. And it was after further reflection that I accepted judicial appointment. But I'm a proud affirmative action appointee. Why? I had the potential. All I needed was a chance to demonstrate my capabilities. <laughs> and what we must do, all of us, black and white, when you get an opportunity, don't just sit back and say, I'm a black man. I'm a woman. Yes, when is the next promotion coming? What have you done? <laughs> How did you use the first opportunity that you got? Meritocracy is what explains progress. If you fail once you are there, you are doing damage to the prospect of others being elevated as well. So affirmative action is part and parcel of transformative constitutionalism. Because many were excluded deliberately in the past, and we have decided that we are going to be united, we are going to form a new nation, it's proper that we uh, level the playing field by identifying those with potential, preparing them, grooming them for ascendancy to positions of higher responsibility. But don't disappoint once you are there. Uh, whistleblowers. I think it is the second time in a gathering that I have heard that. And in fact, at some stage, I think there was a case before the Constitutional Court because uh, whistleblowers, a certain whistleblower and the family were very unhappy about how exposed they were how, and the conditions around the protection of whistleblowers and realizing that they've had to abandon their work environment so that corruption and crime is rooted out, how then do you look after them? I think it is something that we must all talk about. I don't know the solution. I think whatever suggestions we have in relation to the need to incentivize whistleblowing, protecting them, and providing for them appropriately, we should put them forward. Um, I can't claim to be familiar with all the challenges that come up with, uh, with whistleblowing, but fundamentally here is the issue. What happens to whistleblowers is always going to depend on leadership. I'll give you an example. Somebody told me that there is corruption in one of the, of the courts. And I said, and the person is not even involved in the court system. So I said, please, I need information to do something about it. He said, no. The judicial officers are not prepared to come up with uh, information because uh, they don't want to endanger their lives. I said, they can tell me on condition of anonymity. I think something needs to be worked out to at least share information that can be relied on for the purpose of investigation, and only if it is not possible for any other independent witnesses to be found should the one who blew the whistle be made to testify. I'm told during the apartheid era you would wear a blanket. <laughs> Maybe that blanket story could work or whatever mechanism. Credible. <laughs> 
or whatever mechanism we can come up with. But let it be something that we put our minds to, find a solution to, to it. I would suggest, I, I don't know if you have seen the relevant ministries, whether it's intelligence, justice, or the presidency, to see what protection they can offer, including the police and the NPA. I think a discussion with those could, uh, could, uh, could yield a solution. If it gets too difficult, even if I don't have a, a, a solution, uh, the people who uh, control my life are here. Just uh, give them the document. Let's see what we can make of it. Thank you. Mm, affirmative action appointment. <laughs> Chief Justice, that makes two of us. <laughs> Right, um, ladies and gentlemen, let's take the next set of questions. You were first. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Well, uh, <laughs> Chief Justice, <laughs> <laughs> don't you think perhaps we need to revisit the seminal year 1994? We have got a constitution, but my question is around the condition. Do you think the, condi the conditions in our country are allowing for a transformative constitution or the aspiration of the constitution were too idealistic? Why am I saying that? In order for us in this country from where I'm sitting, Chief Justice, to achieve this economic revolution you mentioned, Unfortunately, we are going to be confronted with the race question. So my question then, uh, Chief Justice, you also alluded uh, about poverty, but they now even call it multidimensional poverty. Because that aspiration of a family as a form of government is one that is in the ethos of our constitution. But because of our condition, we do not have fathers in communities. We, do not, we have situations where the people in our country on a daily basis are stripped off of their own dignities because they are not economically emancipated or platform of that nature have not been provided. So my question would then be, do you really think we can achieve economic revolution in our country without fiddling on the race question? Or perhaps we need a national convention where we revisit 1994. Perhaps question, why is it then do we not achieve all three generation now rights? Because we're only able, in my view, I might be wrong, to we're only able to achieve political rights, but we have a situation where we have an economy. I, I'm not sure whether you get me. Chief yeah. Justice. Uh, I, think, I think the Chief Justice gets you. Thank you. The Chief Justice gets you. Thank you. Right. Uh, let's, let's look at the back. At the back. Somewhere behind. Um, the person at the very end there. Um, right there. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we have to be multidimensional. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chief Justice, mine, mine is a very contentious issue. Um, there's an anomaly in South Africa that is colored identity, and that is the colored experience. And this derives from the rejection of the term and the identity by academics and professionals in our spaces. But we see that this is something that is institutionalized in our spaces as well. So, and this is a classification that is much recognized within South Africa. So. This is a discussion that we can have if the whole day, but my question is what role would you say the constitution and leaders of our society played in battling colonialism and also contributing to transformation regarding this topic? Thank you. The last, the third question, right there in the middle. The back, the back, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good evening to... Uh... Silence. Go ahead, go, wait a minute. 
You have the mic. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yo, you guys have no idea. It is to... Yeah. <laughs> Yo, uh, so what to ask the Chief Justice? So many questions, but my no, Just one, just one. Yeah, obviously, obviously. Just one, just one. So my main question, Chief Justice, um, obviously, I refer you to a, a statement made earlier uh, this year in Parliament, just after the elections, by Dr. Grunewald, um, in which he questions the relevance uh, and the objectives of our current PE system, and if it really achieves its objectives. Because at the moment, it's just putting the wealth in the hands of a small, mi a small minority of black people. And we're sitting with the same situation that we said during apartheid. The only difference is that the color of the people sitting upstairs has changed. And the people downstairs are still not getting enough, not benefiting enough. It's like the people upstairs are just showing off the BMWs, the NSCs, the Chirac, where the people downstairs <laughs> And, and Chief Justice, it bothers me, and, and I, I would I'd like to f conclude also with a, with a comment, what you made about the Competition Commission. Shouldn't we rather, instead of forcing this drastic change in our employment, focus on developing small businesses? It bothers me, Chief Justice, because the more companies we have, the more jobs we create. At the moment, the current company sitting there in Santa, they full. They full. They're not going to create... So whoever's up there, um, whoever's up there, yes, it is black people now, but the people downstairs are still struggling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We... <clears throat> You know, I, I am one of those who believe that the dawn of our constitutional democracy was never meant to immediately deliver to us everything that we desperately needed. It was intended to lay the foundation on which you and I and generations to come were to build so that we can march forward. And that started with voting. But because the intention to transform is there, however inelegantly articulated it might be in the Constitution, you will find that preamble, improve the quality of life, free the potential of each, section 22 of the Constitution, uh, freedom, the right of freedom to trade, occupation, profession, and section 217 of the Constitution that demands that special attention be given to the previously excluded, particularly when, when government is, um, is, uh, is dishing out work. Were we not too or overly idealistic? I I don't think so. I think the major problem was, as soon as we became a constitutional democracy, we sort of, we were either very uncomfortable to confront issues that needed to be confronted head on because we don't want to offend, or we thought things will somehow work themselves out. That is why you still have even tribalism, even you have racism, you have uh, this about the Indians, this about the colors, this about the blacks. I mean, I was watching some march in Eldorado Park. A man who is even uh, darker than me in pigmentation said, yeah, you are only looking after black people. <laughs> so I, I think we did not we do not identify what is required to take us from where we do not want ourselves to where we want to go. One, even when section 217, and maybe I'm answering the BEE thing in the process in advance, was operationalized, what happened? My own uncle, who was a, an unskilled laborer, 
used to work for what was then the South African Railways. They were retrenched. His former boss called him back to say, no, 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 uh, the work has opened up. What happened? He was made to sign papers. In no time, he was fired. He was surprised, so he lodged a case. Lodging a case, the people looked at this case and said, no, you are incapable of being fired. They said, what do you mean? He says, you are the owner of the company. He said, what do you mean I'm the owner? He said, there is a document. You are a director, you sign. So how can anybody fire a director? What happened? There was dishonesty on the part of his former boss. He needed a contract from government in terms of section 217 of the constitution and needed a black face, what we call fronting, and got my uncle. But that is even maybe better. Some of the people who deserve to be empowered with, with their eyes wide open, go there to be used to corrupt the system so that those that are supposed to benefit from it do not benefit from it. Others who are not supposed to benefit from it do benefit from it. I'm telling you, my brother, we would go far even if we were to start now. If only at every level we insist on ethical leadership, courageous leadership, and visionary leadership. You know, even at student level, I'm not sure that it's everybody who turns out to be a student leader who deserves to be there. <laughs> even SRC. <laughs> Some are good, I believe, but not all. A thoughtless person can just intimidate you, terrorize you, and then uh, boom. Oh, he's a president. We must insist everywhere that we are led only by people who deserve to lead us. When you are there, what needs to be done to give practical expression to the values of our constitution, to our shared aspirations, will be done. You will be, we will begin to make progress when that happens. I mean, look at any sector, the agricultural sector. Why is it that land was given back to those who were, previous, who were dispossessed of their land and the land is lying fallow? What happened? Did we not know that it's not everybody that we're giving land to or that we are going to give land to who possesses the technical know-how and the capacity to use it properly? And if we knew, why did we not prepare them for that eventuality? The same applies to farming. People are given uh, these Nguni animals. It could be 10 or 20. But how many of them? Do we check? Can this what does this, has this person ever had an experience with cattle or goats? Will he or she look well after them? Are we setting people up for failure? And then encourage those who don't believe because there are people who believe that white people are evil. There are people who believe that black people are fools. They can't do anything. You are going to encourage those loose cannons to stick to, our guns, to their guns and say, we told you. <laughs> but if we do everything right, agriculture, education, if the beneficiation in the mining industry that we identified a long time ago has been necessary, was put into practice, there would be jobs. There would have been business opportunities created for many South Africans. Why is it so difficult to beneficiate? I'm in mean, South Korea. Part of the secret behind its success is this. They don't have iron. They don't produce iron. They don't produce steel. But one of their major industries is about steel. Why? They take steel from those who are refusing to beneficiate and beneficiate in their own country. Why can't we do these basic commonsensical things? It is when you do that, that the things that we fail to do will be done. South Africans are hardworking people. And we cannot have a program that is designed to keep them receiving money that they have not worked for. Even young people.
It can't be. So the economic revolution is a real possibility. What we need is to seriously look at what did those who have achieved that revolution do? What did they prioritize? Science and technology, top quality education, going out not on a tour, but to see what those who are successful <laughs> did to get to where they are and implementing that. If we do that, we will go far. And also, you can free, free money from some of these government. I, I still don't understand, Prof, why uh, our government, national, provincial, and local government, why we are leasing buildings. The explanation that I was given is that it's expensive to maintain. Why am I able to maintain my own house? <laughs> the enrichment of those who don't deserve to be enriched is part of the problem. And there's a lot of money that you can free if you can take care of that issue. There is so much job opportunities and business opportunities. If, and I'm answering my brother who was uh, referring to Dr. Grunewald, if only you can design these programs in such a way that it's not one, two, or three people who benefit. You don't have to create multimillionaires when people are unemployed and hungry. You can create something for everybody, provided there is an, 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 an ever-going program for capacity building. In other words, you don't take a dentist, as it has happened in one province, to build a, a, a road and then abandon it after collecting some money. You build capacity, you distribute work to people who will deliver quality work. You don't give a, build, a house building project to somebody who will build things that crack and collapse on people. You will insist on quality, but that, uh, spread it across as many people as possible. Colored identity. It's a very sensitive issue, my brother. Um, Dr. Ruben Richards, I had a meeting with him last week, Thursday, in Cape Town, has written two books about the history of the First Nation people. He differentiates between Kalats and First Nation people. He says some actually prefer to be called Kalats, others resent it because they are not Kalats. He explains what the difference is. But here is the point. It appears that not enough was done to, uh, to address that issue. But my point as in relation to everything else is that it's never too, uh, too late. I've engaged with the First Nation people, and the first time I did, I see Dr. Arno is here. He was part of that meeting. It was here in Bloemfontein. We had a meeting of a diversity of South Africans, including the traditional leadership or kings of the First Nation people, to reflect on, among others, what is it that needs to be done to make sure that the First Nation people are not made to feel like outsiders in their own country. When opportunities arise that they deserve to be given, they should, as a matter of preference, also be considered for those opportunities. I think it's a sensitive issue that we must all give it our all to address. And the Constitution is just the right instrument to do that. You can't talk about equality. You can't talk about a South Africa belonging to all who live in it, united in our diversity, without giving um, attention to that issue. I know there are other sensitivities like, no, 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 uh, abandon the land first, give it to us, we will decide how to handle it. Those are some of the issues that we should sit down and reflect on. And finally, BEE. -E. I think conceptually BEE -E is a wonderful thing. The Kapstadt Sake Kamer that I was addressing last week, Thursday, part of what I said to them was the role of the Afrikaner Bruderbund. And apparently it provoked the Afrikaner Bruderbund. Now they want a meeting with me, which is a wonderful thing. They are not angry. <laughs> they are not angry. They are, they are happy because I recognized one good thing they did. The concept of think tanks We've just fought the English people. It looks like we are on our own. These people can't help us. What is it that we are going to do 
to empower ourselves. That's how some of these huge business enterprises that are Afrikaner owned came into being. That is how some of these universities, like the old uh, what Ranza Afrikaanse University, Pretoria University, Stellenbosch, and so on, came into being. They were saying, you can copy the positive aspects of it. Something needs to be done. People with the capacity to guide us as to how to do it should lead the charge. Tell us what we need to do, and we must identify people who are qualified to implement it to do so. So that's how Africaners who are not into business space, but more into the agricultural sector, who are not known to be high-powered intellectuals, generally speaking, became these mighty intellectuals that we now have. How can it be wrong to apply it correctly to the previously disadvantaged? To say, you too, are citizens of South Africa, and injustice referred to in the preamble ap applied to you. It was institutionalized against you. What needs to be done? No, 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 BEE. -E. The problem with BEE -E is not the very concept itself. It is the application. If you apply it well, it's a wonderful system. It has worked for... Uh, Afrikaners, it wasn't BEE, -E, I don't remember what it was called, but it was a BEE -E equivalent. And it worked well for them. It can work for all of us. As for greed, that's why I speak against greed. Where greed reigns, I will want to monopolize all the tenders. I will give those who dish out tenders something to oil their hands so that when the tender comes, they must phone me first. I said, there's a tender for this. <laughs> My brother, are you not submitting? Because they know I'll give them something. We've got, to be, we've got to be very thorough in dealing with corruption. That way, BEE would be applied credibly, would be applied to the advantage of those who deserve it. And remember, it doesn't even benefit black people only. If you are a white-owned company, but there is a decent representation of the previously disadvantaged. You show that you are committed to this national unity, this reconciliation. You want South Africa to belong to all who live in it, not some of them. Then there, it's an incentive. You score points, you get to win government uh, contracts. Let's just do things right. That's how to build a country. And these things that divide us, we must identify them and push them aside. Somebody said something about racism. Racism is alive and kicking. And so is tribalism and ethnicity. The fundamental question is, what are you going to do? Which side are you going to, fall, to belong to? Are you going to say, no, these whites are racist, all of them. They just pretend and hug you. When they leave you, they are going to wash their bodies. <laughs> or... Ah, these blacks. Oh, the, the Bobayane. What, which side are you going to belong to? My view is that there's a critical mass of South Africans who are sick and tired of this division, who are prepared to do everything within their power to unite South Africa and to share. I mean, one of my neighbors back in Mafikian, who is uh, in the... In the logistics uh, industry, asked me to meet a number of farmers, uh, um, I forget the date, some three uh, Mondays ago. And I met them, top, top, top farmers in this country. But they were with a young man who is not only a farmer, but also a lawyer. He said to me, sir, there's something that worries me about our country. I said, what is it? He said, for as long as there is inequality, for as long as there is poverty and unemployment, the worst that we fear is unavoidable. I said, well, you're right. The question is, when you see that the worst is looming in the horizon, what responsibility do you think it imposes on you? You actually don't even need legislation to bring about the change that we desire. 
You've got to find it or instill it in your heart to do to another person what you would be happy if they do it to you. The reality is this, and it was here in Paris that uh, the president of the Brabant Farmers Association in Namibia, Mr. Van der Merve and I were addressing the meeting. Mr. Van der Merve said, he said to about a thousand farmers from South Africa and the SADC, he said, in Namibia, we as white farmers realized that an injustice was done to black people. We are the only ones who own the majority of the land in Namibia, and it is not fair. He said, so we took it upon ourselves to share, to compromise. And it doesn't mean giving your land to, to, to people even if you have 200 hectares or 400 hectares. It's all about finding it in your heart to accept as the truth. Not that you are a land thief, but that you were advantaged by the previous government to the disadvantage, to the prejudice of others. And no injustice is sustainable. No injustice is sustainable. It is not. So what are you going to do about it? Because when the people of Alexander, when the people of whatever village are hungry, they will remember that truth, that reality. And if you are ducking and diving and there doesn't seem to be any willingness within you to be considerate, to look for solutions, all you ever say is, yes, the state has got a lot of land. Why doesn't it give to others? That's true. It must do it. But those of you, our white compatriots, who have as much as 25,000 hectares, I know of a farmer, I buy bulls from him, 40,000 hectares of land. You don't really have to give it away, but you can give it in a compromised form. It doesn't have to be market related. You can see the fire is raging, as in Brazil. It needs to be stopped. And the way to stop it partly is compromise and sharing. Otherwise, just imagine, if this government were to say, that which was done during colonialism and apartheid must happen now. And you take the land of all our white compatriots and give them the villages. Will it be right? So let's look for a lasting solution. One of the worst things you can ever do is to say to our white compatriots, no, 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 no. There's nothing wrong with the land issue. It's a lie. You are giving them false hope. Another dangerous thing is to say, no, 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 you must come and collect all this land of the white people. After all, it belongs to your ancestors. There's a reason behind the Freedom Charter as crafted. There's a reason behind the preamble as crafted. South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. So let's go out there and work out solutions. There are solutions here and elsewhere. Um, <laughs> we could go on and on and on and on until tomorrow, but uh, I think we don't have that luxury. We shall take the last three questions. The very last three questions. As I said, please be brief. Let's start with the, in the corner there. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll come there, I'll come there. Let's start there. Go ahead, go ahead. Good evening, Chief Justice. My question is, um, what is your view about the funding of the NPA by private individuals? Um, would that... Can you, can you repeat is, that? Can you repeat what that? What is your view about the funding of the NPA by private individuals? Would that um, um, impose a future danger to our constitution? Thank you. Funding of the NPA by individuals. Okay, we got that. The next question will come from the front. I am sorry I ignored you now. It's your turn. Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice, good evening. Wonderful to see you again. Um, Chief Justice, probably the biggest giant in front of us uh, is the economy. Um, to a large extent, structurally, the economy 
could be at the brink of collapse. And we have a situation regarding ESCOM. Uh, the, 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 the business people have been speaking and saying, listen, if this matter is not addressed now, this country, it's, it's over. Um, so my question is, how does uh, transformative constitutionalism speak into the economic situation? And with, with bearing in mind the issue of politicized economic policies, where economic policies favor political interests. Uh, does constitutional, uh, transformative constitutionalism cut through that in some way or provide some direction? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take the last uh, question. Good evening. No, 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 no. Just hold on. Just hold on. Just hold on. The last question in the corner there. Right. We will take four. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah. No, 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 just in front of you, just in front of you, please, let's be orderly about this, right there, yes. Thank you um, for that, Prof. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My question is uh, to you, Honorable Justice, in regards to if we ever say that the preamble of South Africa, of which we are firm with, and which state that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. What are we doing about a, a certain group of people in Orania, in the Northern Cape province, of which have isolated themselves from other people? Uh, they have their own currency, they have their own rules, of which uh, that's in contrast with the territorial, I believe, principle which states that whoever governed in a continent or a country uh, has to affirm to that rule, to those rules of that country. What are we doing about that group of people? Thank you, thank you. Wait. So, so we, we, we will take one, must, one last question, the fourth question. Uh, the fourth question. Right here, right here. That's the last question. Be brief. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chief Justice. Um, Chief Justice, I would like to hear your opinion about our system uh, right now, our political system. What we have now is a political parties running the country, and you find a president who accounts to the top six, not the nation, basically. So when it comes to independent candidates, what is your view on that? Because we have that matter in the courts currently. Isn't that gonna be better than having um, political parties run our country? And Chief Justice, when are you gonna run for president? <laughs> Um, I think government institutions like the NPA need as, as much money as they can lay their hands on. The last time I had f confining myself to the prosecutorial staff, over 500 vacancies or posts remain unfilled and money is the problem. But if anybody wants to contribute, let them give the money to Treasury. The NPA must never know where the money comes from. They can even do it by uh, paying more tax, volunteering to pay more tax, and uh, they can have it as an item, uh, NPA funding or whatever. But to give it directly to the NPA, what's going to happen when they next have a case, when they are accused of corruption or one criminal act or another? So the NPA must never receive money directly from anybody. ESCOM, I don't think I'm going to deal with the ESCOM directly. <clears throat> but I'm going to touch on something in passing, and that is privatization. I don't know whether it is good or not. But I know that countries like China have they are running companies very well. I also know that some of the people who run our big mining houses and industries were ordinary lawyers like me. Some of them were state employees. Meaning that it is possible 
if you were to appoint those people to run some of the SOEs that we have, to run them as successfully as they run those mining companies, as successfully as they run those successful industries or manufacturing ent entities, it's always about whether an individual or individuals who are appointed to run a particular entity have what it takes to do it or not. There's no magic formula about private sector, public sector. If it is because of the regulatory framework and you want the state-owned enterprise to work, change the regulatory framework to make it possible for these people to function as optimally and as possible and with their desired speed. Listen to me. It takes human beings to run anything. So there is no magic about being in the private sector. No, you are a human being just like me and uh, uh, you and I. Why is it? I mean, some people say you don't attend, understand economics. That's why you talk like this. Really? Why is it that we had uh, somebody with a diploma in engineering to run our treasury so well? Why is it that we have somebody with a degree in pharmacy to run our, our treasury so well? It means even I can run a uh, treasury. So even I can run a company and run it very well. All you have to do, like a good prime minister, good president, surround yourself with people who have the technical know-how, listen to advice, look for people who know how to implement, not people who talk all the time and do nothing. People who know how to get things done. Appoint them and... Let things be done. So ESCOM needs to be attended to urgently. The question is, how? Who is advising us about ESCOM? What's their history? What's in it for them, if any? There, is, there seems to be a hunger for privatization. What does it mean? It means troubled state-owned enterprises are going to be sold for a song. People are going to make money out of it. And then we buy from them. If transformation in the private sector is so, so slow, the statistics released recently says the top management of the big companies, at least 87%, is white males. 25 years down the line? What is the problem? Let me explain myself. Am I saying you must rush black people into positions of responsibility even if they lack the technical know-how? No, I'm just saying. I believe, without any evidence, that there are white compatriots who, when we became a democracy, had no experience whatsoever in business. But now, they are high up there. Why is it possible with white males but not with white women? Why is it possible with white males but not with, uh, with, black, with black males and black women? That's the unity, the reconciliation, and the solution that is based on truths and not false hopes that I'm talking about. You see, we, and that comes to Orania as well. South Africa is one big family. And the man, the analyst I was talking to today says to me, you know, in a family setting, and that has always been my attitude, there will always be that uncle or that auntie <laughs> who, when you have an issue to resolve amicably, once you hear him coughing from outside the house, you know this thing is going to be scuppered. <laughs> Did he have to come at this time? <laughs> so you'll always have in this big South African family, Elements that don't want to belong to a family. You know, in the Bible, you talk about the prodigal son. I suppose there are prodigal daughters as well. You just decide you don't want to be under anybody's authority. You are going to be on your own. However ridiculous it may be, the problem lies in looking at that uncle and that aunt and saying everybody who looks like them facially, or maybe uh, twangs the way they twang, is exactly as they are. 
It's easy to look at Norania and say, yeah, Afrikaners are bad people. Really? Are they all in Orania? <laughs> oh, are those family members in Orania? The uncle who cough, the auntie who cough or whistle disturbs you just when you are about to solve an issue. You're in the middle of the Lobola negotiations, you are about to clinch a deal, and you know when they come, <laughs> oh, they will say now, who, has, who slaughtered this uh, goat? Because I'm the senior uncle. I'm the one who should have put the knife. <laughs> this goat is for all intents and purposes unslaughtered. <laughs> in a nutshell, you will always have incredibly unreasonable members of the South African society of different skin pigmentations, of different home languages. But there is a critical mass of those who just want South Africa to move forward. I'm telling you, we have an incredibly beautiful country. A very rich country. And there's enough for all of us. Let us just take a decision against greed. Damaging even the environment as long as you can make money. Did you see that, uh, that uh, documentary in Al Jazeera? People just dumping toxic material in Johannesburg. That makes babies sick. That makes animal cripples. Why? Greed. Just want money. Doesn't care what happens to people. So let's cleanse our country of the greedy people, of the heartless people, of the divisive people, and look wherever you are for those who want genuine unity and reconciliation who are not faking it. There are many of them, black and white. If we could unite along the color lines during apartheid to say what apartheid was doing was injustice, and you have people like Wumbeyer Snodier saying, no, they can condemn me all they want. I don't want to be part of wrongdoing. Then you can rest assured, now that we even have this constitution and these laws, there are many black and white people Africaners, Greeks, whoever, who just want the future for their great grandchildren. They don't want to go away. They don't have any other home. Their home is here. They want to make it work. Some don't even understand. It's my responsibility to make my fellow family members understand. It is your responsibility to make me understand where I don't understand. Yeah. Top six. You know when the matter is before courts, there's a particular terminology. They say it's subjudic. So I don't think it would, maybe before the matter was there in the constitutional court I could comment, but I think let's just say, let's wait for the decision of the court and uh, take you from it. Our constitution gives us all we need to move forward. Let's use it optimally to transform our country because once we have transformed South Africa, we'll transform Africa and we'll transform the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been a very wonderful audience. Now, I'll, I have just one more request to make. I'm glad I forgot the one about the president. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say nothing about it, I can assure you. <laughs> so, so we just have one little uh, part of the, of the program, just to say thank you. And I'll call uh, Professor Karin Van Mali to do that.
Good evening. Justice Mokweng, we the people of the UFS want to thank you for coming to the Free State, to Bloemfontein and to the University of the Free State. I think the sheer numbers here, and we have people also on, on what is it? Live stream, thank you. Um, show our, our deep appreciation. Um, maybe members of the judiciary, legal fraternity, council, executive, students and, and staff, thank you for your presence. Special word of thanks to our dean for not only continuing this prestige lecture series, but for the enthusiasm that you do it with. Thank you very much. I know, I know there's a whole team also behind you who assisted you. Um, I know you don't want us to use the term the Dean's Office, but the team that you convened, I don't want to leave anyone out, but I, I noticed um, William here, Aldi, Lizelle, um, who else, Lizelle, William, Aldi, Lebo, of course, and a number of students from our different student associations. Um, also some academics, uh, Brandt, Jo Marie, Kanya, for just helping us for things to run smoothly. Justice Mokweng, thank you so much for your words, for your, for your message, for telling us that transformation should, play, should take place and can take place on the level of the everyday, on our everyday practices and that each of every one of you can take part in it. Um, thank you for, I think, leaving us with an encouraging and a challenging message. But ultimately, I think the words that we'll all remember is that it's not too late. Not too late. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I said a few minutes ago that you've been a wonderful audience. The way you have conducted yourselves makes some of us want to go on and on and on. Thank you very much. Now, so as the Chief Justice walks out of the room, I'll ask you to rise as they do it in the court, remember? And then, and then I'll ask you to sit down again. I'm asking for a favor here. And allow the people sitting in the front rows here to go out first. You will realize that this room is, is, kind, of, is, is kind of funny. There's one door that we all entered through. Then there are doors at the, gate, at, at the back. I don't know whether they are open, but we tried to open them. But if you could kindly let the people sitting in the front rows, about seven, seven, eight rows, walk out first, and then you can follow, I'll be extremely grateful. So the vote of thanks has been given. Thank you very much. Thank you, just Chief Justice. And I all wish you a wonderful evening and a safe journey back to where you came from. Thank you very much.